Have you found God yet? I mean, really found God in that sense of deep down, I know what God is and what the meaning for me is. Have you found God yet? I have. It happened in one of those absolute, unsuspecting, out of the blue, out of the ordinary moments. I had during college been a janitor and had spent much too much of my time between cleaning rounds, sneaking some pages of reading. And so it was that I had read John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie in Search of America. In his book, Steinbeck chronicles his adventures driving around the country with his faithful companion, Charlie, a French poodle. The year was 1960, Steinbeck was 58 years old, and he had outfitted the back of his pickup truck with a cabin-like camper unit in which he and Charlie spent most of their nights. Steinbeck had decided that he wanted to finally, in a first-hand sense, see the land that he had been writing about for so long. He wanted to hear the speech of real America, to smell the grass and the trees, to see the colors and the light. These were Steinbeck's goals as he set out, to rediscover that country which he had been writing about. So together with Charlie, Steinbeck drove the US highways and byways and country roads. He dined with truckers, encountered beers at Yellowstone and old friends in San Francisco. Along the way, he reflected on the American character, racial hostility, the particular form of American loneliness he found almost everywhere, and the unexpected kindness of strangers. The book itself is inspirational, and upon reading it, I decided that I would leave my job and drive around the country in hopes of finding what he wrote about and hopefully finding myself. I didn't have a dog, but I did have a tiny Toyota Tercel, and I filled it to the brim with camping equipment and SpaghettiOs. <laughs> Enough SpaghettiOs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for over a month. You see, I was at a bit of a crossroads in my life, and at some level, my choice to drive was motivated by a desire to get away from myself. But I was also searching for myself. I was in my early 20s, most of my friends were establishing themselves in their careers, and I, well, I was certainly lost. I had left college early without finishing my degree, and I no longer wanted to be the music teacher I had been studying to become. My call to religious work was strong, yet I wasn't even old enough to be a youth advisor, never mind a minister or religious education director. And I definitely did not feel like I had enough life experience from which to draw resources. So it was that I put my life on pause and drew plans to drive around the northeast quadrant of the United States. Up until that point, I hadn't really ever left the small hub of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. As I was driving, I saw pieces of our country that were awesome and breathtaking and phenomenal. I should mention also that it was October and the leaves. Oh, the leaves. There were a multitude of oranges and yellows and reds for sure, but the blues and the purples, I had never seen anything like it. It was, in fact, while I was driving from Appleton, Wisconsin to Iowa City, Iowa, that I discovered a beautiful mountain range. It's one of those highways where you have just two lanes going in either direction, and because it was on a mountain range, a fierce crosswind that would buck my car from side to side. So my car and I, bucking and waving, weren't paying as much attention as perhaps we should have been, instead looking out at the reds and yellows, oranges, purples, and greens of the leaves on the trees. It was breathtaking, and I got myself lost. Very, very lost. And there is only one major road that goes from Appleton, <laughs> Wisconsin, to Iowa City, Iowa. And I was lost. As I said, I had been in search of myself, yet I was realizing as I drove that I was searching 
for something that I was also running away from. And if you haven't tried it yet, you cannot quite run away from yourself, even in a car. So there I was, deep in thought, contemplating the meaning of life and what I was going to do with mine. When all of a sudden I looked up and I had my first God experience. That's right, right there in the southern regions of Wisconsin, where I least expected it, I found God. My ter Toyota Tercel and I, as I looked up, were inches from a humongous 18-wheeler truck. On the back of the truck was painted the letters G-O-D. <laughs> and under that, guaranteed overnight delivery. <laughs> as surprising as it sounds, in just that instant, as I swerved my car and hoped we didn't crash, I in fact had found God both in the humorous and in the inspirational sense. I had found that divine moment in my life where there was absolute clarity. Not only did I avoid smacking into the back of the truck, but in that moment I realized that the definition of God mattered a lot less than the relationship we have with God or spirit or universe or any of the many names we call the holy and divine. I came to believe and to realize it was not just the relationship with that divinity, but also the relationship with each other that is important. Who would have ever thought that such a profound epiphany could come from almost colliding into an 18-wheeler rig named God? <laughs> the experience for me was transformational. It was the very point in my life where I opened up to the possibility of being inspired by the most unusual of sources, which turned out to be a good thing. Once I found myself and relocated myself on the map, I made my way to Iowa City a few days later. And I had some time to explore the city before I was to meet up with a friend. And I should say at this point that up until this moment in my life, I had collected Converse All-Star sneakers, the high tops that came in all the colors and all the shades and all the designs. I had, I think at that point, about 47 pair. <laughs> so some, some, called it an obsession. <laughs> I like to think of it as a way of expressing myself. But I had been looking for a particular pair for several years. I had been looking for just the right pair. And as I browsed around the downtown of the quaint college town of Iowa City, I saw that pair. It was a fluorescent orange pair of chucks, and I knew that they were there waiting for me. And so I entered the store and asked about them. The youth behind the counter replied in a slow Midwestern drawl, I beg your pardon? I repeated my question, inquiring about the shoes, and he repeated his. I wasn't sure what to say at this point. <laughs> so I put on my best puzzled look, and I pointed to the sneakers. He stared at me for a moment, looked at what I was pointing at, looked back at me and responded, if you speak more slowly, maybe I can help you. <laughs> I tilted my head and asked, really? And he said, nah, I heard your Boston accent and figured I'd have a good time with you. <laughs> we had a good laugh and I walked away with a pair of fluorescent orange chucks that had sat on his shelf for eight years. <laughs> so I had a good feeling about my trip and the people I was bound to meet, and I had a new understanding of the possibilities of the universe. And I can say that while each of my Chuck stories is good in and, un in and of itself, I derived a much deeper meaning and message from my collection of Converse Chucks. I don't still have the collection, but they live in my memory and in the memories of many of my friends. 
and each pair or memory symbolizes to me that there are many ways to converse, to forge relationships with each other and with others. Another place where time and again I find inspiration is through television and movies. I once stumbled upon J. Michael Straczynski's Babylon 5 series, which continues to be, to me, the most inspirational piece of multimedia I have ever found. Take this scene, for example. Captain Sheridan of Earth asks Ambassador Delenn of Mimbari, one of the other worlds represented on Babylon 5, which is a space station five miles long designed specifically for peace. The captain asks the ambassador what the lighting of the candle means in her religious services. And she answers by saying, life. Sheridan asks, whose life? And the ambassador responds, all life, every life. We are all born of molecules in the hearts of a billion stars. Molecules that do not understand politics or policies or differences. Over a billion years, we foolish molecules forget who we are and where we came from. In desperate acts of ego, we give ourselves names, fight over lines on maps, and pretend that our light is better than everyone else's. The flame reminds us of the peace of those stars that live on inside of us. The spark, that tells us you should know better. The flame also reminds us that life is precious. Each flame is unique, and once it goes out, it's gone for another, forever. There will never be another quite like it. Such high inspiration from a television show. But consider this. In the early 1990s, J. Michael Straczynski wrote the Babylon 5 series to span over five years. He also wrote the entire storyline from start to finish before trying to sell it to any network. Straczynski wrote the series using the standard literary outline an author would use for writing a novel. If he had only written the story in book form rather than as a television series, perhaps he would eventually gain the same status for his story that any other form of writing we now use for inspirational fodder has. But he did not, and as a result, many people will not have the benefit of hearing his prophetic voice. But perhaps he knew he had a better choice at spreading his work through modern media. Perhaps he believed that if my generation began a new trend of being more television bound than book bound, we wouldn't be in the universities and religious institutions learning the messages he brings. So he had to use a medium which we would pay attention to. In either case, I don't know, I know that I leave just about every episode of his a changed person, even the episodes I've seen a dozen times. Here is my favorite scene. The Centauri Emperor had never left his home world, Centauri Prime, nor had he really ever made a decision for himself. He was bred for the position of emperor, and in every situation he found himself, there was a clear choice to make for the sake of his world. His world, which had been at war with another world for almost a century. But now, at the end of his life, he has realized that many of those choices were perhaps not the moral or ethical ones. He risks his health and endangers his life to travel to the Babylon 5 station so that he can stand on neutral territory and apologize to the world and to members of the world he had been at war with in person for all the things his people had done and for all the things his family had done. He wanted to say that they were wrong that the hatred between their people would never end until someone was willing to say, I'm sorry, and try to make right the things that were wrong, to atone for their actions. He said it was the only choice he ever made in his life, and as he lay on his deathbed, he feared that even that was being taken away from him. And so, in a conversation with the station commander, the emperor shared this revelation. revelation. So much has been forgotten. So much pain, so much blood, and for what, I wonder. The past taints us, the present 
confuses us, the future frightens us, and our lives slip away moment by moment, lost in that vast, terrible in-between. But there is still time to seize that one last fragile moment, to choose something better, to make a difference. Our reading this morning, which also comes from Babylon 5, reminds us that we are all one and must be kind to one another. The Centauri Emperor challenges us to use our lives to make a difference. How can we even begin to fulfill these challenges if we do not build relationships with one another and all that is holy? How can we not do this if we don't keep ourselves open to the unexpected inspirations? For all that I have experienced, I believe it is in forging and sustaining these relationships in our lives that we learn the most from, about ourselves, about our friends and family, our surroundings, and our community. And so I leave you with this reminder. You never know where inspiration is going to come from. Leave yourself open to the possibility that it might arrive out of the least expected source. I've heard the universe has a funny way of making you drive right up to it. <laughs> May it be so.